Hello there. My name is Minister Barton Aaron Porter, and today we're going to go into our Father's Word for another exciting Bible study. Now, I'm going to be using the good old King James Version of the Holy Bible, as I always do. So I encourage you to get your Bibles out and to study along with me. Let's approach our Heavenly Father's throne with a word of prayer before we get into this video. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come with bowed heads and humble hearts, confessing our many sins, Lord, asking that you forgive us, wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. We put all our hope and trust in that precious blood he shed for us at Calvary, Lord. And we ask right now, Almighty God, that you fill us with your precious Holy Spirit, as we go into your word, the Holy Bible, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we thank you, Almighty God, for hearing our prayer. Amen. The title of today's Bible study is, How Should Christians View Politicians? Now, this is a Bible study that the Lord has been preparing me for for a very long time. So I got a chance to have this shirt made just for this video. This is my no Democrat and no Republican Party shirt. And on the back, it says Jesus Christ for president. So we're going to get into our father's word and see what the Bible has to say about politicians. Now, I want to start this Bible study with a couple of verses in Psalms 146. And there the sweet psalmist, King David, being guided by God's Holy Spirit, wrote in verse 3 and 4, Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. He says in verse 4, that was verse 3, His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Now, this is very important because there are people who truly put their trust in earthly rulers. Well, the Bible tells us not to do that. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, with all your mind, in other words, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't lean to your own understanding. Uh, that was verse 5, verse 6. In all thy ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him, acknowledge God, and he shall direct thy paths, and he will direct your paths. So we should put all our trust in God, not man. Because God is in control anyway, whether you realize it or not. But how should Christians view politicians? Well, the Bible clearly tells us how we are to view politicians. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, the apostle Peter, being guided by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. He wrote, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme, that was 13, verse 14, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So we're supposed to respect our worldly leaders and we're supposed to go by whatever the laws of the land are in what country we live unless they contradict the word of God. That's the only time when we will not go by them. A perfect example of this is when King Nebuchadnezzar of ancient Babylon had a law passed that everybody was to worship a huge idol that he had erected in his honor. The three Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Ezariah, and Mishael, whose names had been changed to Shatrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they worship the one true God. They knew one of the Ten Commandments said that we're not supposed to worship in front of idols. So they refused. 
and he was going to have them burnt up and the Lord stood with them and protected them. So that's just one of many examples in the Old Testament of how we do not go along with the laws of the land when they contradict God's word. I have to say that all the time because people read these two verses and if they're not familiar with the whole of scripture, they think they could think that they're supposed to go along with whatever wicked law that man comes up with. No. So we're supposed to be in submission to them unless what they're trying to tell us is against God's word, okay? And then... 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 tells us something very interesting. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, that's a request, prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, Paul instructs us. That was verse 1, verse 2. He says, for kings... And for all that are in authority, now he tells us why we would pray for these people, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So that's why the Apostle Paul, being guided by God's Spirit, instructs us to pray for the leaders of our countries and governors and mayors and presidents or whoever, so that we can live a peaceful life. All right? So the scripture clearly tells us that's how we should view politicians as just people that God has there, some good, some bad. Because in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2, King Solomon wrote, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. And this is very true. When we have politicians who truly have the people's interest at heart voted in and other people there in positions that can help that politician make laws or enforce laws that's going to benefit the people, everybody rejoices. I remember when Perry Washington, the first black mayor of Chicago, was voted in, things were really good in Chicago, Illinois for African Americans. So this is very true. Uh, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Then the rest of the verse says, but when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. And that is so true. When you have a corrupt politician up there who could care less about the people, just there to get what he can get and do the will of the Bilderbergers, the rich bankers and all these wealthy people who meet in these secret meetings, who a lot of times have bought these politicians, the middle class and the poor suffer because they're just going to enforce rules or have rules, laws established that's going to benefit the rich. So that's true. When the wicked bears rule, the people mourn. So that's why when it comes to voting, you should pray to God to direct you in your voting. He will guide you who to vote for. Ultimately, it's going to be his decision anyway, but sometimes he allows you and I to be part of the process to put that person in office. Now, but most politicians, unfortunately, are corrupt. They get in that position not because they have the people's best interest at heart, because they know it's a good position for them. It's a good paying job, and it puts them in the position to steal money. You can just check the history of corrupt politicians that have been exposed, and it just goes on and on and on. And that's why Christ referred to King Herod as a fox. You know, a fox is one that's clever and sly and sneaky, deceptive. In Luke chapter 13, verse 31 and 32, it reads, The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, these were religious leaders in the time of Christ, corrupt religious leaders, saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. So they came with a message from Herod. They said, You better get out of here, Jesus. Get out of here right now, because Herod is going to kill you. Now look what Jesus said in verse 32. And he said unto them, or he said to them, 
Go ye and tell that fox. <laughs> Behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. Jesus wasn't worried about him. He said, you go tell that corrupt politician, I'm going to be right here doing my father's will. And even when I am offered up the third day, I'm going to be brought back. So the Bible doesn't speak favorably of politicians. And I'm not saying there aren't some who are good. Like one I can think of that, in my opinion, was a good politician was Ron Paul. And he seemed to be a genuine servant of the people. He really seemed like he wanted to do good for the people that he was supposed to be representing. But that's a rare thing. Most of those politicians are scumbags. Most of them are. And always understand that God is in control of every government and the people in it. So that's how people lose sight of what's right when they start putting their trust in a politician thinking, if I get him in, then everything's going to be all right. No, God is in control, even when he allows the bad ones in. He has a reason for doing it. That's why Romans 13, starting at verse 1, Paul writes, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Uh, that's one, verse two. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So in other words, when you're going against the government, you're going against the ordinance of God, and you're going to get in trouble. That's why he says they're going to receive damnation. Verse three, he says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, listen, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shall have praise of the same. In other words, rulers are not looking to punish people who are doing what they tell them to do. And that's a fact. It's the ones that's going around not doing what they tell them to do that's going to get in trouble. And that's why he says, be afraid of that authority God has given them. And he says, but if you are a law-abiding citizen, you're going to see praise from that same ruler. There are people who have been given the key of the city for their contributions and good works. That's just an example. And there are famous musicians who have been honored to meet the president and, you know, things of that nature over in England. Certain famous people have been knighted. So that's an example of what he's talking about here. Then he says in verse 4, for he, talking about the ruler of that government in which you live, for he or she, because sometimes it's a woman, because we have women rulers, for he or she is the minister of God to thee for good. He or she is God's servant to you for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. In other words, God has given that ruler the authority to execute his wrath when you're not going by the law. For example, in certain states here in America, we have the death penalty. So if you kill somebody in that state and you get caught, the governor has authority from God to have you put to death. So we need to understand that all these governments stand in place by God's will, even the bad ones. Then he says in verse 5, Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. In other words, you need to be in subjection to them, not, because, not only because God has given them authority to execute his wrath upon you, but because you understand that their authority comes from God. You see, now he says, in, that was five, he says in six, for, for this cause pay ye tribute also. This is why you pay your taxes, in other words. For they are God's ministers attending continuously upon this very thing. So that's why we pay taxes because some of our tax money pays for those rulers who are in those 
positions. And it's, like I said, unfortunately, there's a lot of them that are corrupt and they're abusing that position. But God can get them out of there when he wants to. So you and I should not view politicians as our savior or as our means of survival or good having good government. No, we should not. Because we're putting too much trust in a temporary world if we do. And the Bible clearly tells us in 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then verse 17 says, And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You see that? So that's the way you and I should view any government and government rulers. This is a temporary system, okay? It's going to be replaced by the kingdom of God. Now, that's why you and I as Christians are to put our hope and faith and trust in God Almighty and his son, Jesus Christ, because he's going to come and establish his kingdom on earth. And that's the only time we're going to have good government because he truly has our best interests at heart. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 31, he says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewith shall we be clothed? Or with what shall we be clothed? In other words. 32. He says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, the, the non-Jewish nations who didn't know God, he says, for your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows what you need. He says in verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. See, a lot of people fail to realize that Christ didn't just come to die for our sins and to redeem us from the fall and put us in the position to, re to receive everlasting life. But he also came to make it possible for us to inherit the kingdom of heaven, which is a literal government that he is going to establish here on this earth in the future that's truly going to bring peace to the entire world and the entire universe. That's why Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 says, and in the days of these kings, that's the final 10 kings that's going to be ruling with the Antichrist. That's what he's referring to. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And here's the good news. Verse uh, Daniel, I mean, even more good news. Daniel 7, verse 27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. That kingdom belongs to us. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, it belongs to you. We're going to have the perfect government and the perfect president, Jesus Christ. And it's going to be a beautiful experience that's just going to go on and on and on. That's why in Psalm 72, the sweet psalmist wrote about how wonderful it's going to be when Christ is reigning as the ruler of this planet for all eternity. It says, starting at verse 6, He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. 7. In his days shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. Verse 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river 
unto the ends of the earth. His dominion is going to be complete. The whole earth is going to be under his authority at that time. It says in verse 9, They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. 10. The kings of Tarshish and of the owls shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Uh, that was 10, 11. Yea, which means yes, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. 12. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that has no helper. Verse 13, he shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. 14, he shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence and precious shall their blood be in his sight. See, there's going to be no more suffering when Jesus established his kingdom here on earth and justice is going to be meted out fairly. No one's going to be mistreated anymore like it is right now. Notice all these things he's going to do for the poor and the needy. And then 15 says, and he shall live and to him shall be given the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continuously and daily shall he be praised. 16, there shall be an handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof, or the fruit of it, shall, shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. In other words, there's going to be plenty of food. Nobody's going to be starving. 17, his name shall endure forever, his name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. And so the Bible constantly spoke of how Jesus was going to establish the perfect government, the government that people are foolishly thinking that Trump or Joe Biden can deliver or some other politician. No, it'll never happen. Jesus Christ is the only one who's able to bring in the perfect government. And it was prophesied that he would. So in closing, we're going to read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. It reads there, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government, see that, shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That was 6 verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with and with justice from henceforth or from this time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you ask me who I am voting for come election time? My vote has already been cast. I'm voting for Jesus Christ as president. In other words, I put all my hope and faith and trust in the Son of Man. Jesus, the one who died for me. I know only when he established his kingdom on this earth are we going to have good government. If this particular Bible study has been a blessing to you and you want to bless me with a love gift of any amount, this is how you can do that. Go to paypal.com, download the PayPal app. It's free then you would use this code to send me your love gift. PayPal.me slash Barton Porter. You can also download the free cash app, which is the one I prefer. My code is cash.app slash dollar sign Barton 1014. And then there are people who prefer Zelly. For Zelly, all you need is my name, Barton Porter, and my phone number. 
which is 630-441-4563. Now, here are non-financial ways you can be a blessing to yours truly and this ministry. I need your prayer, saints. Pray for Minister Porter and pray for this ministry. And share the Bible study videos. If you're being blessed or encouraged or taught through this ministry, share these Bible study videos with as many people as possible. And if you have any Bible questions, or prayer requests, you can call me at 630-441-4563. I live in Illinois, so I'm in the central time zone. And if you don't have a phone, you can email me, Porter at gmail.com. I need you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please hit the subscribe button. It does not cost you a penny. And underneath the video also, after you hit the subscription button, there's a little bell icon. Click on that bell icon. That bell is the notification icon. Every time a video is released, you will get a notification. And underneath the video, there's two thumbs, one up, one down. If you like my video, if you like the content, please take the time to hit that thumbs up button. And please take the time to put something in the comment section. Now, these shirts that you see me wear all the time are my own designs. I have an online t-shirt store. It's godwear.store. So please check out the t-shirts, the hoodies, the women tees, the cups. If you see something you like, buy it because you're getting something that you can use to share the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. And you're also blessing this ministry as well. So, until next time, this is Minister Barton Aaron Porter saying, may the good Lord continue to bless you and keep you all the days of your life. God bless you and goodbye.